This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Spencer Bruding. I'm Will Johnson. I'm Jessica Knoll. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. People lined up all the way to about a block away, coming in one by one, telling me they were sorry. People said they were going to find out who did that, and they were going to get even for me. The story begins in 2006 on the Lower Brule Lakota Indian Reservation. With a small population of around 1,300, it's a small reservation of Lower Brule Sioux, one of the bands of the Greater Lakota Tribe. Although relatively close to the state capital of Pierre, it's considered pretty rural and tight-knit, a place where everyone knows each other. Vicki Eagleman is 33 years old and lives on the reservation. She's recently divorced and has five kids. Vicki is in between jobs and decides to move her young family back in with her mother and stepfather. That's just until she can get on her feet again. Vicki has a lot of friends and is well-liked. She was real quiet. Uh, she was a really kind person. That's June Left Hand, Vicky's mother. She's called in from South Dakota, and her connection is a little spotty. I remember breakfast, she would be in the kitchen with her children, and they would be all standing on chairs, or the younger one would be sitting on a counter, and she would be talking to them while she cooked. She, didn't, she couldn't stand and clutter or a mess, and she tended to her children and her nieces and nephews, because with natives, we're taught that you are also the mother of your brother or sister's children. So she treated her nieces and nephews like they were her own, and she and her sisters had a, had a closeness, and regardless of anything that happened, they, uh, they were always there for each other. She, unfortunately, was the victim of domestic abuse throughout her adult life. Lou Raguse is a reporter for CARE 11 in Minneapolis. He extensively covered this case when he was based in South Dakota at the time. Vicky started dating a man whose name is Bernard LaRoche. He was known as Sonny. One day in late July, Vicky, Sonny, and a group of their friends decide to hang out. So it was July 28th, 2006. Vicki Eagleman told her mother, June Lefthand, that she was going swimming. So she left the house with some friends. And for some odd reason, I did sit there watching her, watched her go to the end of the block, go down around the stop sign, and go down the sidewalk until I couldn't see her anymore. And they traced her movements pretty well. She, she went with her boyfriend, Sonny, his sister, and her boyfriend, and Vicky's own sister. And they went swimming. And they ended up going to a spot that's known as, uh, they call it a drinking spot, but it's basically a party area along the Missouri River. And there were several eyewitnesses who saw her there. And that's the last place that anybody saw her alive. June's husband, a tribal police sergeant, works late, gets home, and goes to bed immediately. He wakes up early and notices that Vicky didn't come home. And next morning he had a uniform on getting ready for work, and he said, Vicky didn't come back. He said, Sonny made it back to his shooting down. Oh, did you go check? And he said, yeah. So I waited. All day, no calls. And even though she was an adult living with us, if she was going to not come home, she will say, is the number on the caller ID? I said, yes, I know where you're at. She said, okay, that's where I'm going to be at, and I'll either be back late tonight or I'll be back in the morning. After waiting several hours, June starts calling everyone that she knows. No one has seen her daughter. She tells her husband to alert his fellow officers. Vicky is missing. Well, that afternoon, her sister came back. And she said they were with uh, Vicky earlier that day and dad dropped her off. She didn't say where. She said her and Sonny were fighting. And she said we had Aaron with us too. So I said, Aaron? That's uh, Sonny's sister. And Aaron, besides her brother, every chance she had, she would always uh, physically beat on Vicky. So it had me worried there for a few minutes, but she said, no, this time she said Aaron was actually on Vicky's side because she seen it for herself that it was her brother that was the aggressor. And we uh, had to drop Sunny off, she said. June says that after waiting for several days, she files a missing persons report and then starts reaching out to hospitals and other local law enforcement agencies. June, you know, kept asking authorities to look into it. The uh, local, the tribal police, which fall under the uh, BIA, uh, were in charge there, and June's husband happened to be an officer with them. So he's, you know, trying to, to do work on his own, going door to door, asking anybody if they've seen her. I was angry at that point, so I marched into the police department and I demanded from my husband and his secretary that they give me John Long's phone number. He's the, the boss of our bosses for that area, the western area, I think, or eastern. He said, I know who you are. This is John. I know who you are. I don't appreciate you calling here. He said, telling me how to do my job. But that's your husband and the local police officer's job is to find your daughter. I started crying. It was the first time that I started to break down a little bit, and I'm not that type to do that. And he noticed, so he stopped, and he said, don't worry, he said, I'll find your daughter healthy, safe, and alive, and he hung up, and I went home. 
I cried a little bit, and then I put that on hold. She had a life, and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Hune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is the yellow car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. But the FBI didn't get involved until almost a full month later. In that time between Vicky's children whom June was watching over, found Vicky's glasses about a block away on the road, smashed up as if somebody had driven over them, and a ring. And this was before the FBI even considered it a potential homicide investigation. They weren't looking into it at all. So June turned over those items to authorities, and, and yet it took all the way until late August before anyone started looking into it officially. As the FBI begins their investigation and local law enforcement continues theirs, June begins receiving these strange calls from community members with their theories about what might have happened to Vicky. They meant well, but I heard one horrible story after another about how so-and-so killed her. And they went into detail and described things. I couldn't even sleep. I couldn't even do nothing. June relays every theory she hears to the criminal investigator in charge, thinking it'll add some sense of urgency to the investigation. But it continues moving slowly. Two months later, the community takes Vicky's case into their own hands and organizes a search. And actually, it was probably on August 22nd is, is when I got word that there was going to be a big search. There were horses, searchers on horseback. There were ATVs. There were trucks. There were boats in the Missouri River. And it was a, a pretty large-scale search for the area. I mean, it was over 100 people, which in, in a small community like that, it, it looks like a lot of people out there all at once. And we interviewed June, and it was just an absolutely heartbreaking interview that uh, it, it basically felt like she hadn't seen her daughter in a month, and she felt like nobody cared. And, and I really got that impression the first time I talked to her. It was just absolutely heartbreaking. You know, my, my husband practically gave his whole life to the Bureau. Okay, I used to joke and talk about it and say I was actually the second wife of my husband because he was first wife of the BIA. And I thought all the years that he put in, they would help us, but they didn't. Also, we interviewed her boyfriend, Bernard LaRoche, and his interview really struck myself and my photographer as odd because he was not going out with the searchers to look for her. He had alcohol on his breath and it was the morning and he kept referring to Vicky in the past tense. He said stuff like, she was a great mom, she really loved her kids, she was a, a great woman. And I mean, anytime that when somebody is presumed to be still alive and somebody's talking about them in the past tense, that raises red flags. The search turns up nothing on the first day, but then in the early afternoon of the second day, they discover something horrific. And then my grandson, which is her oldest boy, he was 12 at the time, he was at the Boys and Girls Club and he came running back. He was all sweaty. He said, Grandma, Grandma, they found my mom. Is it true? He said, did you get to see her? I knew then that they didn't find her, find her. It's really sad because June's husband, which would be Vicky's stepdad, was actually there when they found her. It appeared that her naked body had been stuffed into a culvert and there had been a big rain and the water had pushed the body out of the culvert. And he said that she was lying there with her arms outstretched like she was on a cross and her hair flowing behind her head almost in an angelic pose and absolutely went into shock and, and had to be pulled away by the other officers. He didn't want to leave her there and it was just a, a very emotional scene. The Missouri River is huge and so you know if she had been dumped into the Missouri it would have uh, potentially been even harder to find her if she had been taken down river but it really looked like she had been stuffed into this culvert from one of the uh, streams that comes out of the Missouri. Now with a body, law enforcement cordons off the area and begins collecting evidence, and they quickly believe that they have determined a cause of death. It was obvious that she had been killed with blunt force because she had a crack on the side of her face, on, on her cheek, and, and it, granted it had been a month, so the body had begun to decompose. However, that part was obvious, and June tells me that later on when they did the autopsy, the coroner let her know that it was obvious to him that she had been sexually assaulted. Plus, her body was nude when she was found. And so all those clues pointed to that she was sexually assaulted and then beaten to death across her head. Because she's not the person, not the type of person that anybody would harm. That's why I could, I just can't understand that. I just can't wrap that around my mind. Why would anybody do that? She's not the type that argues or nothing. She's not that way. Police begin interviewing friends and family and they start with the people who last saw her. And one of the first people they look into, of course, is the boyfriend, Bernard Sonny LaRoche. However, 
believe it or not, he kind of has an alibi, and the alibi is June's husband, Vicky's stepfather, because he has a habit of checking in, check, you know, when, when people come home, looking in the door to see if they're sleeping in bed there, kind of checking on everybody in the family. And he peeked in the door and saw that Bernard was sleeping in the bed there. And while it's possible that there would have been time before going to bed to carry out the crime, they think that that is a decent alibi, you know, enough to definitely have to look into other suspects. Vicky also had an ex-husband who she had recently divorced from, but they clear him pretty quickly. In fact, I told him there was no need to question him because he was in Japan at the time. As weeks turned to months, and with no new leads on the case, June says law enforcement efforts just began tapering off, leaving a lot of unanswered questions, including what's next for Vicky's case. If she was sexually assaulted, you have to wonder, well, why don't they run DNA and find out who the person is that sexually assaulted her? And that's one of the questions that remains unanswered because we don't know if they were able to you know, find any DNA evidence or was her body too decomposed at that point? Did the fact that she was in a culvert, you know, it, where water was flowing, did that mess with the potential evidence? Those are kind of the questions that we just don't know and, and Vicky's family doesn't know either. But then Vicky's case files are found outside of the police station. At some point, case files in, in crime scene photographs ended up found on a sidewalk in Lower Brule. How they got there, no one really knows, but they apparently were not being cared for enough that they just got tossed out on the street, literally. And they got picked up, collected, and brought back to police. And that, that was just one detail that makes you wonder, like, what the heck is going on here? Now, more than a decade later, June is still desperate to get her daughter's case solved. She still calls local law enforcement for updates. She recently saw the original investigator in charge of Vicky's case, and she approached him. When I seen him in Pine Ridge here, about a year and a half ago, I said, Fred, do you remember me? He looked down at me and he said, of course, he said, I would never forget you. I said, there's been something I wanted to say to you. I said, he said, you really botched up my daughter's case. And I said, I don't like you. But I said, I'm still going to be here until I die every, every few years or every few, few months or even every day I might be calling you for a week. I said, then let it go, then call you. I said, because they wouldn't investigate because they told me it was not the child that was missing. He just stood there and stared at me and he said, I'm really sorry, June. He said, I understand how you feel. For June, solving this case would provide some personal closure, no matter how small. And for Lou, he too wants to see this case solved. This is definitely one of those cases that I want to see solved someday because I want to see June left hand, Vicky's mother, get that closure. And one of the most painful parts is how she knows there are people out there that know what happened. And they might be people that are friendly to her. They might be people that went to Vicky's funeral. And no woman should have to live with all those question marks. My granddaughter and my my oldest grandson, her old, two older children, they are, uh, they don't, they didn't forget her, and they talk about it. They miss her. They want her back. They want things back to the way they were, and it can't be. And it's caused a lot of anger, bad, bad feelings towards each other. Sometimes I can't go along with my granddaughter, and I, I can't be please her mother no matter how much I try. So, Spencer, anytime we're talking about any kind of group that has uh, some level of, of secrecy, if you will, I mean, Native American reservations, they, are their own, they have their own system, their own government, their own police force, uh, that creates a situation. It feels like that's at play here, certainly, to some degree. Yeah, well, there's, there's jurisdictional issues, um, and there's a very real historical um, distrust uh, from Native American tribes and groups of people against the federal government. I mean, they have been, uh, they were decimated, and then they were put on reservations, stripped off of reservations. And so it kind of becomes a negative feedback loop where a crime happens on a reservation. Uh, the tribal police are not able, they're not equipped or they're not able to solve it. And then when the FBI comes in to try and bring justice, the people that are within the tribe don't want to invite them in. They don't want to talk with them because of that um, history there. And then the FBI kind of say, well, we're not getting the information we need to solve this. So there, you know, there is this legal divide uh, of investigators and, and that makes it really difficult having covering cold cases. Um, you know, I can tell you that it, it takes an all in effort. And if there's a divide, I can see why cases like this go unsolved and, and there is no resolution. When you also have to mix in the idea that these are rural areas, um, Oftentimes, the tribal police forces aren't necessarily thoroughly trained. Um, they have completely different laws and regulations than the U.S. government has. And then on top of it, you throw in really intensive weather. Um, in the wintertime, people can disappear. Bodies can disappear. Um, uh, lakes freeze over. Uh, ponds freeze over. It, it's a very intensive area to live. And so for the FBI to come in and have to balance the historical 
problems between themselves and the tribes and then on top of it add in difficult weather and difficult geography and rural uh areas that's a recipe for a lot of cases not being solved does june feel like her daughter's case is ever going to be solved she is a very stoic figure she's a really impressive matriarch of her family and there are many many grandchildren and you have to remember there are five of vicky's kids that are now in their late teens or early 20s that are still trying to gain justice for their mother and remembering their mother but june has said that uh as time goes on more emotion is coming out she started very strong and now she when she thinks about june she breaks down this is 13 14 years later and so i think that the emotion is just as raw but i think there's a certain level of hopelessness that she is experiencing because no one is taking up this case there's no resources for cold case investigators the tribal police don't seem to have any new leads they can't do anything and then the fbi don't seem to care in this particular case i know lou ragus at care uh brought this story to us it's one that he clearly cares about he's covered it in in his past as a reporter uh but but fantastic reporting from lou oh absolutely and he not only is he just has been involved in this case but he has a deeply rooted relationship with june left hand and he checks in with her often and they continue to communicate and talk and he asks for updates um and uh he wants this solved before june he wants june to gain and and vicky's kids to gain some sort of uh closure even minimal well i i think you know our hope as podcast hosts and producers is that getting the story out there again and in, into the the public eye might garner some um new leads or new tips and and at least bring some awareness to her case absolutely and and, and i think that again if, if anyone were to have any tips um or remember any information they would want to contact the fbi and tell them about you know that tip or or a little memory that they may have had about vicky or that day and if you'd like to hear more from lou ragus at care k-a-r-e he has a, another really amazing podcast it's called 88 days the Jamie Kloss story about a young woman who was kidnapped and then eventually uh, found freedom. Again, that's 88 Days. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Spencer, thanks for bringing us the story this week. And Jessica, where can people learn more about us? Vault Studios is on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, as well as True Crime Chronicles on Facebook. And we also have a Facebook group called Inside the Crime Vault, where we discuss these and other cases. And and we invite you to not only discuss the cases we're covering, but also um, tell us some cases that you think we should be looking into. That's Inside the Crime Vault. All right, we'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.